You might think that a ghost would get nowhere near a courtroom considering that court cases and trials usually require evidence and ghosts are something that notoriously there has not yet been any really reliable evidence produced for. But you might be surprised that ghosts being involved in one way or another in court cases has really quite a long and varied history. Hi, I'm Juliet. Welcome to my channel where I discuss myth, legend, folklore, ghost stories and weird and wonderful history in general. Let's get into it. One of the most common tropes in ghost stories is ghosts revealing that they have been murdered and who murdered them. This goes back to at least Euripides 5th century BCE ancient Greek play Hecuba in Western literature. And in the Odyssey there is also a character called Elpenor who reveals that he has died to Odysseus, although in his case he wasn't murdered. So the idea of a ghost revealing to somebody how they died and particularly who killed them appears a lot and it appears in real life ghost stories and ghost folklore as well as in fiction. However, ghosts actually getting as far as a court case is a little bit rarer, although there are, as we'll see, plenty of examples. The stories that I'm looking at today involve ghosts that are somehow involved in a court case, giving evidence in some cases, or at the heart of some kind of litigation. I actually left out a whole bunch of examples from the early modern period and from the 19th century, where what looks like poltergeist activity comes up in court cases. Uh, usually this is people who have been accused of witchcraft, and modern specialists go back and look at the accusations and go, this looks like poltergeist activity. So things involving stone throwing and weird tappings and furniture moving and things like that. So I haven't actually looked at those today because in the cases themselves, no one actually mentions ghosts. The accusation in those cases is that somebody is a witch, somebody is perpetrating witchcraft, and that is the crime they're accused of. And that is a whole other subject of its own. So I'm focusing today on cases where ghosts are specifically brought up in one way or another in court. There is a very famous example from fiction, which is the short story that the movie Rashomon is based on. It's called In a Grove and was written in 1922. Rashomon is famous for telling the story of a murder from four different viewpoints, giving four completely different accounts of what happened. And one of those accounts is the account of the murder by the victim. And in the short story, the victim speaks through a medium so that the victim's account can be heard alongside the perpetrator and the witnesses. There's also an example from ancient Rome that may be fictional. This is a text by an author called Pseudo Quintilian. So we have an author called Quintilian and people thought this was by him, but now we think it's not by him. It's a text called Declamaciones Maiores and historian Daniel Ogden has called this particular case a rhetorical exercise on an absurd hypothetical situation. The theory is that this text is being used to train people in public speaking and in speaking in Roman law courts. So they've made up a ridiculous sounding case just to get the students to be able to practice their rhetorical arguments. So according to this text, a mother was seeing the ghost of her son who had died as a young man at night and he was coming and spending the whole night with her and he was hugging her. He was notably different from most Roman ghost stories. Usually the ghost appears as a corpse or in the state where they died, they're usually quite grisly and they're usually insubstantial and can't touch. But there are other exceptions as well. There's a ghost who even has a sexual relationship in one story from Phlegon of Trales. But anyway, uh, in this case it's not sexual, it's a mother and son. But the mother was getting a lot of comfort from these visits. Her husband, however, was not enjoying these nightly visits quite so much, so he called on a magician to bind the ghost with a spell and with iron chains. And the ghost was then bound into its tomb. So in ancient Roman ghost folklore, if you put iron chains on the dead body, it is supposed to stop the ghost. Although in one famous example, the ghost just haunts the house anyway, dragging the chains behind him. In this case, the mother then takes the husband to court for mistreatment because she had been getting a lot of pleasure from seeing her son every night and spending time with him. And so the husband is mistreating her by putting a stop to these visits. So that one may have been intended as a fictional hypothetical case rather than a real one. But as we move forward in time, we find more and more examples where ghosts do genuinely seem to have been referred to or even called upon in real life court cases. 
We have an example from China. Beginning in 1789, a Confucian Chinese imperial librarian called Ji Yun wrote five volumes of over 1,200 tales of strange or paranormal occurrences and weird stories, which is now known as the Shadow Book in English. According to Ji Yun, an account preserved in the history of the Ming Dynasty, the volumes of the Five Elements, concerns a woman who had been dead for three years, taking up residence in the recent corpse of another person. So this is a ghost who is inhabiting a dead body, a bit like a zombie, but it's somebody else who snatched the body. The legal authorities concluded that when determining identity, one must give precedence to the nature of the body rather than the soul. So they determined that the person with the legal right to the body was the dead person whose body the ghost had taken over. They arrived at this determination not because it was inherently more just, but because it was more practical. Only the physical could provide the type of evidence with which courts were comfortable. And this is a theme that we're going to see come up several times in all of these examples, is courts having to work out the balance of physical evidence, which is what they should, as courts of law, be relying on against the evidence or involvement of ghosts. Of course, in some cases, getting hold of physical evidence is downright impossible, as with a famous litigation case involving the apparent ghost of Mark Twain, aka Samuel Clements. In 1917, a medium called Emily Grant Hutchings published Jap Heron, a novel written from the Ouija board claiming that it had been written by Mark Twain via Ouija board dictated to her and another medium called Lola Hayes beginning in 1915, and it was eventually published seven years after his death in 1917. Mark Twain's daughter, Clara Clemens, took Hutchings and her publisher to court, wanting to stop them from profiting from his name. So Clara Clemens' argument, obviously, is that they are using her father's name to sell more copies of their book. The trouble was Clemens could not prove that the book wasn't written by a ghost. As we mentioned, the constant tension in all of these cases is that ghosts cannot be proved or disproved so far. If anybody does come up with absolute proof, great. But at the moment, they, their existence cannot be disproved, but it cannot be proved either. Courts of law require proof. So because it couldn't be proved that the book wasn't written by the ghost of Mark Twain, the lawsuit had to demand that either Hutchings admit it was a fraud, because a confession will work as proof, or Hutchings should surrender all profits to Twain's estate and his publisher Harper and Brothers on the grounds that he wrote it. So they get around this issue of proof by saying, look, either my father wrote this book and you owe us the profits, or he didn't write this book and you're a fraud and you need to confess. Hutchings, however, absolutely refused to do either. She would not admit to fraud, insisted that the whole thing was true to her dying day, uh, but she did withdraw the book and destroyed all copies, and Clemens agreed to drop the lawsuit. So in a way, nobody won. <laughs> nobody actually settled the case. Uh, but the courts of law did establish that you, you cannot prove or disprove a ghost. So you can't win a court case by saying ghosts aren't real, basically, because you can't prove that ghosts aren't real any more than you can prove they are. <laughs> One of the most common types of court case involving ghosts in some way is litigation around haunted houses. So issues where people have rented or bought a house that then appears to be haunted and whether they are owed anything by a tenant or a seller or whether they owe anything to a tenant or a seller. And there are several examples of this. One example from British occupied India. This is from the Book of Indian Ghost Stories. Uh, S. Mukherjee published two editions of this in 1914 and 1917 during the British occupation of India. And it relates stories collected from newspapers and other local sources. Mukherjee says, a curious little story was told the other day in a certain civil court in British India. A British major who he refers to as Brown, which is a pseudonym, and his wife moved out of the large house they had rented after three weeks and the landlord demanded rent for the whole term of the lease and they took him to court. The Browns claimed that about 15 days after moving in, they heard the sound of a number of feet along the corridor, even though it was a carpeted corridor. They looked at their bedroom door and three shadowy forms walked in. A white European man in night clothes, a white woman in night clothes, and a woman of colour who was probably an Indian ayah or nurse. That's a, a nanny, a baby nurse, that type of nurse. The couple could not move. The three figures searched the room and then left, and were heard in a couple of neighbouring rooms and then disappeared. Major Brown then brought his Indian chowkidar, which is a night watchman, to give testimony. And this is the testimony that the night watchman gave. 
This house was built two or three years after the mutiny. That's the Indian mutiny. I have always been in charge. After the mutiny, one judge came to live in the house. The judge had to try a young Mumahadan charged with murder and he sentenced the youth to death. The aged parents of the young man vowed vengeance against the good judge. On the night following the morning on which the execution take place, it appeared that certain undesirable characters were prowling about the compound. I was then the watchman in charge, as I am now. I woke up the Indian nurse who slept with the judge's baby in a bedroom adjoining the one in which the judge himself slept. On waking up, she found that the baby was not in its cot. She rushed out of the bedroom and informed the judge and his wife. Then a feverish search began for the baby, but it was never found. The police were communicated with and they arrived at about four in the morning. The police inquiry lasted for about half an hour. At last, the judge, his wife and the nurse all retired to their respective beds where they were found lying dead later in the morning. Another police inquiry took place and it was found that death was due to snake bite. There were two small punctures on one of the legs of each victim. How a snake got in and killed each victim in turn, especially when two slept in one room and the third in another and then finally got out, has remained a mystery. But the judge, his wife and the nurse are still seen on every Friday night looking for the missing baby. One rainy season, the servants' quarters were being re-roofed. I had then an occasion to sleep in the corridor and thus I saw the ghosts. At that time, I was as afraid as the Major Sahib is today, but then I soon found out that the ghosts were quite harmless. In this case, the Indian judge's decision was, I have recorded the statements of the defendant and a witness produced by him, the night watchman. I have also made a local inspection. I find that the landlord, the plaintiff, knew that for certain reasons the house was practically uninhabitable and he concealed that fact from his tenant. He therefore could not recover. The suit is dismissed with costs. So the judgment here was that the landlord knew that the house was uninhabitable because it was haunted and therefore the landlord is the one at fault. That's a 20th century example, but there are much older examples of this kind of litigation as well. According to Victorian writer C. McKay, many centuries earlier, in 1580 in France, a man living in a suburb in Tours called Gilles Blacher tried to cancel his contract with his landlord because he genuinely believed his house to be the general rendezvous of all the witches and evil spirits of France. The noise they made was awful and quite prevented him from sleeping. They knocked against the wall, howled in the chimneys, broke the glass in his windows, scattered his pots and pans all over his kitchen and set his chairs and tables dancing the whole night through. The spirit also threw bricks at people who hadn't said their prayers that morning. Blacher took the case to the civil court of Tours and his landlord Pierre Piquet was ordered to cancel the lease as the house was uninhabitable. Piquet appealed to the Parlement of Paris and after a long examination, the Parlement confirmed the lease. Not, said the judge, because it has not been fully and satisfactorily proved that the house is troubled by evil spirits, but there was an informality in the proceedings before the civil court of Tours, which rendered its decision null and of no effect. So that's an interesting one where the court has actually specifically said that they do think the ghosts are real, but that there was a problem in the proceedings in the civil court and therefore they had to rule against it. Another incident from early modern France was recorded in Pierre de L'Ancre's L'Incrédulité et Mesprange du Sortilège in 1622. So this is written much, much closer to the events, only a couple decades later. Pierre de L'Ancre is well known for writing about witchcraft. So according to Delancre, in 1595, a tenant in Bordeaux had left their rented house because a spirit in the form of a small child dressed in white began to trouble him and his servants in a series of hostile acts which seemed to have increased in menace in quite a short space of time. The spirit would appear three or four times a week, making everything in the house, furniture and household utensils shake and altering its own size from big to small in various ways. Interesting. In the evening, it would draw the bed curtains and then jump on the stomach of anyone trying to sleep. It used to press down on them, close their mouth, prevent them from speaking and breathing. Now that's very like sleep paralysis, which is a well-known condition where people feel like they can't move, they're on the edge between sleep and waking, they often feel there's a dark presence in the room, it may affect breathing. Usually sleep paralysis affects one person at a time, but still. Anyway, we carry on. Uh, the spirit would also transport the male and female servants from the bed to the yard and from the top of the house to the bottom, as well as striking and beating a number of people. The owner of the house, annoyed because of these alleged happenings which would affect the value of her property and her ability to find another tenant, brought the matter to court on the grounds that it was not possible for a house to be infested by spirits. So we see a couple of 
common issues that come up in these cases here. The concern about the effect of an alleged haunting on the value of the property and the owner in this case saying, look, ghosts aren't real and trying to bring them to court on that basis. But the courts decided against her, saying that the tenant's allegation was entirely conformable to the usage and tradition of the church, the authority of the Holy Fathers, the conclusion reached by scholastics, the opinion of philosophers, the decision of legal experts and the experience of many centuries. And the court is correct in this. The theology of the Catholic Church does allow for the existence of ghosts. Um, Catholicism, quite famously, is quite keen on the idea of life after death. And the Catholic teaching of purgatory, where souls are trapped in purgatory for a time, working off their sins before they're able to go to heaven, if they're not bad enough to go straight to hell. Uh, souls are often thought to be able to get out of purgatory and go and haunt people. So the idea of ghosts does fit with Catholic theology. The experience of many centuries is also a valid point. Ghost stories exist in pretty much all cultures, in all times and in all places. So if we took an Occam's razor approach to why do people tell ghost stories, then the most obvious solution would be because there are ghosts. So it's a sensible enough argument. It was probably a bit of a shock to the landlady um, to find that the court was ruling that no, legally, ghosts maybe we can't say they definitely exist, but we certainly can't say they don't. Um, and that basically, yes, the great weight of evidence is that ghosts exist. Now that's an example from very Catholic France in the 15 and 1600s. We might expect more recent cases and cases from countries that are either secular or more Protestant to be a little bit less inclined to legally rule in favour of the existence of ghosts but we might be surprised. There is a very famous case from the United States of America from the 1990s, so a place with definite separation of church and state and quite a large number of people who would be pretty clear that they don't believe ghosts exist. However, ghosts in the case of Stambovsky versus Ackley, otherwise known as the Ghostbusters case, were ruled to legally exist. Sort of. Around 1989 or 1990, Jeffrey and Patricia Stambovsky were in the process of buying a house in Nyack, New York from Helen Ackley. After Mr. Stambovsky signed the contract and made a down payment, Ackley asked her real estate broker Ellis Realty to disclose to the Stambovskys that the house was haunted by a poltergeist, actually by at least three different spirits. According to Ellis Realty, they made the disclosure and the Stambovskys laughed it off saying they'd have to call in the Ghostbusters and Ackley signed the contract. Though according to Stambovsky, he was never told. In fact, the haunting was already very well known in the local area because Ackley had reported it multiple times in both the local press and in a Reader's Digest article in 1977 called Our Haunted House on the Hudson. This included reports of at least three different ghosts, including a pair of disembodied feet wearing moccasins, a man in a powdered wig and Revolutionary War era clothing, and a ghost that would wake the children by shaking their beds, possibly the same one that left presents for the children as well. The house was even on a walking tour of Nyack and paranormal researchers had visited it. But the Stambovskys were from New York City and they didn't know any of that. About a week after the contracts were signed, Mr. Stambovsky called a meeting about the ghosts, which clearly he had somehow heard of by now. After hearing the full story, he wanted to cancel the contract and claim damages for fraudulent misrepresentation on the grounds that this whole thing should have been disclosed at the very beginning, before he made his down payment, and it wasn't. He actually forfeited the down payment when he didn't attend the hearing, but the New York Supreme Court dismissed the action, and then Stambovsky appealed. The appeal court determined that the house was legally haunted because of the well-known story and the press attention. So the issue is not that the appeal court said ghosts exist and we can prove it. The issue was that Helen Ackley had told people that the house was haunted so many times, it had received so much attention in both local and national press, that from a legal point of view, it was a haunted house. Whether or not you believe that there were actually ghosts there or not, it was a haunted house in terms of its reputation, which of course then affects potentially the value of the property. Stambovsky's claim had initially been rejected on the grounds of caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Incidentally, this is a subjunctive. It's not buyer beware, which is an order. It's let the buyer beware, which is a sort of a slightly more order in the form of a suggestion. Anyway, Latin aside, 
The initial rejection of Stambovsky's claim was that he should have done his research, but the appeal court reversed this decision on the grounds that haunting was not something a buyer could reasonably find out about by a physical inspection of the property. That Ackley, the owner, had taken unfair advantage of the buyer's ignorance and created and perpetuated a condition about which he is unlikely to even inquire. So, in fact, the impossibility of physically proving or disproving the existence of ghosts is part of why they made the decision, because Stambovsky might have been expected to get a physical survey of the house done under the uh, principle of caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware check what you're buying before you buy it, but you can't physically check a house for ghosts. So he could not possibly have checked the house for ghosts and they should have disclosed that it was known in the area as a haunted house in the first place. And the whole case has as much to do with the house's reputation and notoriety before the Stambovskys ever went near it as anything else. Although Ackley was all right because she had many offers from potential buyers almost immediately because some people actually want to live in a haunted house. <laughs> So those are cases where a haunted house is at the centre of litigation around the fact that the house is haunted. But what about ghosts actually giving testimony in court? OK, they're not actually called to the witness stand, but the testimony of ghosts being admitted in court is perhaps a more accurate way of putting that. There are a surprisingly large number of these from the United Kingdom, although in many cases it's not the evidence of the ghost that has actually secured the conviction. And in at least one case, the evidence of the ghost is what prevented the conviction from being secured. Gillian Bennett writes, In 1831, Sir Walter Scott wrote an essay for the Bannatyne Club in which he recounted several cases where evidence provided by a ghost was brought to court in a trial for murder, and he focused in particular on the case of the death of Sergeant Davis in or around Glenshee about three years after the Battle of Culloden. So this is in the Highlands of Scotland. The Battle of the Culloden was a battle between the Highlanders and the English, and after that battle was really the kind of severe decline of Highlander culture, partly through deliberate acts by the English. Uh, after their victory. So the English Sergeant Davis was quartered in a remote part of the Highlands and Sir Walter Scott says he was exposed to danger not only from his being entrusted with the odious office of depriving the people of their arms and national dress, so their traditional kilts and tartans as well as their weapons, but still more from his usually carrying about with him a stock of money and valuables. So he's going about um, depriving the Scots of their national dress and their weapons in the wake of Culloden. He disappeared on the 28th of September 1749 and no one could find his body. Eventually a Scotsman called McPherson, 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 <laughs> said that Davis' spirit had appeared to him and told him that he was murdered by two Highlanders called Duncan Terrig Elias Clerk and Alexander Bain MacDonald. In this case, several physical proofs and human living witness statements were collected, but the men were acquitted because the jury laughed at the ghost story, especially as Davis' ghost apparently appeared to the witness speaking perfect garlic, Scots garlic. Walter Scott suggests that McPherson found out about the murder and made up the ghost to try and get a conviction, which is quite possible, theologically speaking, after we die, we presumably don't need human language in order to communicate. So I would say, in terms of the kind of spiritual theory of ghosts, it's not impossible that a ghost might speak a different language than they spoke in life. Um, particularly if the person they're speaking to doesn't speak the same language. Uh, so Walter Scott doesn't say how good McPherson's English was. If he was a Highlander living in a remote part of the Highlands in this period, he might not have spoken English or might not have spoken very much English. Uh, certainly the English Sergeant Davis didn't speak Scots Gaelic. So it's an interesting point. Uh, the jury certainly thought that this made the whole story out to be completely ridiculous. And so Walter Scott certainly seems to think that the fact the ghosts are speaking the wrong language implies that this story has been made up in an attempt to get these men convicted that failed. But there is at least one case from Britain where somebody does appear to have been convicted on the basis of evidence from a ghost. According to a 1905 book by John Ingram called The Haunted Homes and Family Traditions of Great Britain, a woman called Anne Walker was living in a village called Lumley in 1680, so again note several centuries earlier in this case, with an older male relation, Mr Walker. But she left to go and live with an aunt when she got pregnant. Before she gave birth, Mr Walker and a man called Mark Sharp turned up and said they were sending her away to a safe place in Lancashire. 
But two weeks later, a man called Graham had been working late at his mill when he came downstairs to find a woman with dishevelled hair covered with blood with five large wounds on her head. She said she was the spirit of Anne Walker and that she had been murdered by Mark Sharp, implicating Mr Walker in the murder, and she told him where her body was hidden. She told Graham to go to the Justice of the Peace and tell him or she would keep haunting him until he did. And she did keep haunting him. He tried to put it off because Mr Walker was of good character and he was nervous and he didn't want to implicate him in a murder. But eventually the haunting got too much and he went to the magistrate and they found Anne Walker's body and the murder weapon, which was Mark Sharp's pickaxe and Mark Sharp's bloodstained clothes. Sharp and Walker were both found guilty by the judge and executed. And the interesting thing about this is there wasn't any physical evidence against Mr Walker. There was plenty against Mark Sharp, but the only evidence against Mr Walker was that he had been with Sharp when they took Anne Walker away. The main evidence against Mr Walker was the evidence of the ghost who implicated him in the killing. And this might be the only time that a ghost's testimony has actually been part of the conviction in a British court. But it isn't the only time that a ghost has been involved in a case like this. There's a very similar story told in John Aubrey's Miscellanies Upon the Following Subjects, written in 1696. So this story is much, much closer to the events it's talking about, only a few years later, less than a decade. The stories are also so similar, suspiciously so, that I can't help wondering if it's actually the same story that has got changed in the telling by the time it reaches the 1905 book. According to John Aubrey's Miscellanies, a woman called Mary Barrick, so Anne Walker, Mary Barrick, they're not super similar, but maybe over time. Mary Barrick was drowned by her husband William while heavily pregnant in 1690 near Caywood Castle in Yorkshire. William had told her brother-in-law Thomas Lofthouse that he had taken her to his uncle's house in Selby, but shortly afterwards Lofthouse saw a pale apparition that looked like his sister-in-law holding something in its lap by a pond. He told his wife and she concluded that her sister had been murdered. Lofthouse then went to the uncle's to establish that Mary Barrick wasn't there and then he reported her missing to the Lord Mayor of York. William Barrick then confessed, although he later pleaded not guilty and claimed that he had been threatened into the confession. Then Mary's body was found with blows to the head as well as evidence of drowning from where she'd been hit on the head to keep her underwater. In this case, the physical evidence and the confession are what got the conviction. Um, Barrick claimed that the confession was procured under threat, but that was the evidence that, that got the conviction. The ghost only alerted Mary's family to the fact that she was missing, that she wasn't safe and sound with her husband's uncle, that something had happened to her. So the appearance of the ghost wasn't actually anything relied on in court. It was the method of, of finding out that something had happened and then chasing it up and getting that physical evidence. But this is similar to another very famous case from America. And for the third time, we have a woman possibly pregnant murdered by her husband. Edward Trout Shoe murdered his wife Zona by grabbing her throat and snapping her neck in January 1897. But at first he hid the fact that a crime had been committed by moving her body upstairs, dressing her in a long necked dress, cradling her head and showing signs of distress whenever anyone came near. So the coroner ended up not examining her body properly because the husband wouldn't let him get near it and just 1890s justice. Anyway, and Wikipedia, by the way, claims that the cause of death was initially noted as childbirth, so it's not clear whether she was pregnant or not, but... That, again, seems to be a theme. About a month later, Zona's mother, Mary Jane Hester, said that Zona had appeared to her while she was lying awake at night and said that Trout had murdered her, and over the next four nights, she then explained in detail how. Mary Jane then went to the local prosecutor, and he and the coroner exhumed Zona's body and found bruises on her neck in the shape of fingers, a crushed windpipe, and her neck snapped, exactly matching the description given by the ghost to her mother. They also investigated Shu and discovered that he had a history of spousal abuse. His first wife had divorced him for it, and his second wife had died mysteriously. Now, in the trial, Zona's mother was actually subpoenaed and questioned in court about the ghost of her daughter, including questioning on whether or not she was dreaming, which, of course, she said very firmly she wasn't. Trout was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Now, in this case, there's lots of actual physical evidence once they exhumed and properly examined the body. The prosecutors were worried that there wasn't enough to connect Trout specifically to the death. I don't know why, because he literally, like, deliberately hid the evidence from the coroner when she died. Um, that does seem a bit beyond reasonable doubt to me, but anyway, they were worried. 
And so they called in Mary Jane to testify to what the ghost had told her. And they were understandably concerned that that was going to hurt their case. But in the end, the jury convicted Trout. So either the ghost story helped or the jury thought, like I do, that there was more than enough evidence to convict him ghost or not. But that remains the only case in US legal history where a ghost's testimony has been heard in court. And in fact, it's the only one of these cases I've looked at where we appear to have a ghost literally giving testimony in court, not just telling a witness something, but the witness then repeats that testimony in a court of law and it is taken as part of the evidence against the man who was eventually found guilty. So ghosts have a long and surprising history in court cases. And if you're interested in this topic, there's a Legal Eagle video called Ghosts Are Legally Real, which I've linked to below. Legal Eagle obviously knows a lot more about US law than I do and goes into a lot more detail on those American cases. So absolutely check that one out. It is well worth a watch. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like, subscribe to my channel for myth, legend, folklore, ghost stories, and weird and wonderful history in general. Until next time, bye!